hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're looking at um, a sermon that I did today. I preached it today at the Haywood Presbyterian and Reformed Fellowship. We preached it this afternoon and uh, it was a real blessing. So I'm going to just share it with you uh, tonight. It's, it's uh, late now and uh, but I thought I'd share it because um, I want you to be blessed by it, it, it you know. And so if you'd like to turn to your Bibles to Romans chapter 7 and we'll pray. It's good to be with you and uh, if you haven't got a church or a fellowship, um, we meet on a Sunday at 4pm and we're going through Romans. Um, we meet for worship and um, we meet for study of the Word, and then on a Thursday at 7.30 p.m. we meet and we have uh, a Bible study and prayer time, so you're welcome to come. Uh, if you want to know more details, uh, you can find my uh, contact details at jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com, and you can find details there. If you'd like to come to the fellowship or if you'd like to come and help us do evangelism, we work with other Christians, and uh, we've got we've had some really good times uh, over the last few weeks, especially. So, so without further ado, um, let's come before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day and for your grace and your love, and we give you the praise and the glory today. And Father, we pray as we read your word that you bless us now, minister to us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is Jesus Christ, the Heart of the Christian Life. Jesus Christ, the Heart of the Christian Life. You turn to your Bibles, Romans chapter 7. We read, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she loosen from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who raised him from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the latter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of conspicuance. For without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was... Uh, was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandments holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For that what I do, I, I do not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present within me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, but the evil which I would not that I do. 
Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin dwelleth in me. I find then a law that which, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of his death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the Lord of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Um, some years ago there were some Dutch Christians that met uh, some American Christians to do a mission. And the American Christians were shocked that the Dutch were smoking cigars. And the Dutch Christians were shocked that the American women had makeup. And that story tells us that human nature likes to put people under law, likes to condemn and judge people. But also there's a story of Luther where before he became a Christian he would be in a monastery and he would whip himself to try to get close to God, being under the law. And we often whip ourselves, metaphorically speaking. We might have made mistakes, might have failed, and we whip ourselves. And really what we're doing is putting ourselves under the law. Now, what I'm about to say in this sermon, you might be thinking that I'm against the law. And that would be completely to misunderstand what I'm actually teaching and what the chapter is actually teaching that we're looking at. The law is a beautiful thing. Romans 7.14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, so sold under sin. The law is beautiful. Matthew 22.37, if you look at Matthew 22.37, Matthew 22, 37 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these the two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments and the Ceremony Law reflect that we should love God and our neighbour as ourselves, And that's a beautiful thing because the law really is a reflection of the character of God. He says, don't lie, God is not a liar. Don't steal, God does not steal. The commandments reflect the character of, of God. That is the Ten Commandments and the ceremonial and the civil laws reflect the importance of loving God and our neighbour as ourself. So the law is vital, the law is important. 1 uh, John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14, verse 15. 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21. For he, that hath my com he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Here it's quite clear that the law is absolutely important. So what I'm about to say you must understand that I'm not saying the law is not important or that we are not to uphold the law. Please remember those thoughts. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is that the question that I want to ask is what is our relationship to the law? And I want to talk about, first of all, your marriage to Christ. Your marriage to Christ. There's a young girl, this is a story, it's not a true story, but an illustration. There was a young girl and her parents wanted to, her to marry this guy who was wealthy and uh, a very noble, upstanding young man. Now she didn't really want to marry him and he wanted to marry her, but only to judge her and bring his rules 
into the situation. So they get married and he has these commandments and he tells her every week what to do and she does them but feels condemned. His name is called Mr. Law. He's got the commandments and he brings them to her every week and she's condemned and she feels condemned. But then one day the Mr. Law dies and she marries Mr. Resurrection Life. Now when she marries Mr. Resurrection Life, he has rules, but because he loves her and she loves him and they're positionally together, there's a new relationship to these rules that Mr. Law had. Mr. Resurrection Life gives her strength, encourages her and fills her with all the de desire to, to love. And that is what it's like in this chapter. In chapter 7, verse 1 to 5, we are married to Christ. And we are not under the law in its condemnation. And the law cannot save us. The law cannot help us to be sanctified. It is powerless to do that. Romans 7, 1 to 5. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over the man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosened from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, nor she be married to another man. My brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. What Paul is saying is, we're married to Christ, and as we're married to Christ, we are no longer under the condemnation of the law, and we, we are not in our carnal strength trying to achieve the law and coming under condemnation, but we are in Christ and we have a new relationship to the law through him. And we don't abolish the law, we fulfill the law, but it's only being married to Christ and being in, in all the blessings that he has given us that we can do that. Now, there have been debates about the meaning of the passage before us and many great minds have tried to come to an understanding. But uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones gives an excellent uh, exposition of this passage and he points out the, the bird's eye view of these chapters helps us to understand chapter 7. Romans 5.20 we read these words, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The Jews were shocked at this kind of language. Paul is saying where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Paul is talking in Romans 5 that we're united to Christ, we're saved in him, and the law doesn't condemn us. And he says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And the Jews were staggered at this, and they thought if we're saved by grace, we must... Surely then the law is not relevant. Paul brings it up in Romans 6.14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Again, you're not under law but under grace. And the Jews listening to this would think, boy, he doesn't want us to follow the law. And then he brings it up in Romans 7 verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not cover. You see, the law, what Paul is saying is, he's dealing with the issue of the law. What he's saying is, look, the law is powerless to save, and it is powerless to sanctify you. The only way to be sanctified, the only way to change, 
The only way to be justified and the only way to be sanctified is to believe and trust in the blessings of Christ's salvation. Then the Holy Spirit comes into us and then we're able to obey the law. It's kind of like, imagine you live in a shack. It's an old shack. It's rickety and broken and falling to bits. And you go to the post office, you fill in uh, some form to, to the government, but they, they say that you've won a prize. It's a big mansion, a big, big white mansion. And in that mansion uh, is all the food that you need for every day and every year. All the money that you would need, all the resources. It's a beautiful mansion in California somewhere. And you've been given the key. And in your own shack, you've got a few rules and regulations how you live. Well, you've got this new mansion and you are to move from the shack and you're to move into the mansion and there take your rules and your rules are blessed within the mansion. That is what it means by to be married to Christ. The shack is the law with its rules and regulations. Inside you have your rules and regulations. But now you've moved into the mansion of Christ. And the rules and regulations take on a new significance in that mansion. You are in a new situation. And that's what it means to be in Christ. We are in Christ. In a new relationship to the law through Jesus Christ. And it is glorious. Secondly... We've looked at your marriage to Christ, now your position with Christ. Some might say, well, wait a minute, if we're to get rid of the law, and that's what I'm not saying that, but this is what it sounds like. If we're saved by grace, then surely we can live the way we want. So some might say, I can sleep with prostitutes every week and it's all right, or I can, I can do sin and it's all right. But in Romans 7, 24, it says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? Paul is conscious of his own sin because the law points to his own sin. Now, many have debated and argued about the meaning of these verses. From verse 7 to 13, uh, Paul talks about the past tense. And then from 14 onwards, he talks about the present. And you could say, some might say that, it's, uh, it's Paul talking about his Christian experience struggling with sin. I would say, no, it's Paul dealing with our relationship with the law before you get converted. And just before he's converted, he's talking about how the law slain him. The law showed his sin, his desperation, and then he turned to Christ. If you turn to Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers of heavenly places, sorry, that's Ephesians, sorry, sorry, sorry. Galatians 3, 10. It says, For as many are the works of the law are under the curse of it, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continue not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Then it goes on to say that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Paul came to the law, he tried to obey the law, and the law condemned him. And he became so sen sensing his sin that he needed Christ. My friends, are you truly saved today? Do you truly know the Lord? Are you truly born again? You see, the law shows us the sinfulness of sin. If you sin and you're happy sinning, then you don't understand the law and you don't understand the gospel. Because the law shows you the sinfulness of sin. 
The Lord is beautiful, but the law cannot save you. The law will condemn you. If you try to obey it without Christ, if you try to follow it without Christ, you will know what sin really is. You will be exposed. But have you been exposed? Have you come to that point where you know that you're a sinner and you need the grace of God? You need the grace of God. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 1 to 14. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you, to me. Indeed, it's not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of consciousness. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath wherein he might trust, in the flesh I am more circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Ye doubtless, and I count all things but for the loss of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, that I may win Christ. Turn to Romans 7. The law shows us our sinfulness. The commandment, uh, 7 verse 10, and the commandment which was Ordained to life I found to be unto death for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the Lord is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. What then is the which is good made death unto me? God forbid but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Goes on verse 19 for the good that I would do I not but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he goes, oh wretched man, the Lord has kicked in and convicted him of his sin. And he realizes he's a wretched man and he needs Christ. He needs the Lord. He needs forgiveness, restoration. A, a preacher said this, the law was dipped in the blood. The law was dipped. The law condemns us, but the Lord is beautiful. And to uphold the law, God dipped it in blood. What a gracious God that he dipped the law in blood. The law had to be upheld, so he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on yours and my behalf that we may live. And if we have any knowledge of God, then my friend, it will come to this, that we've come to an end in our own righteousness, an end in ourselves. And we've come to realize that what a wretch we are, that we are sinful, that we are hopelessly destined for hell, that we cannot save ourselves. And we say, woe is me. And then we look to Christ and we trust in him for redemption and believe in him for forgiveness. So we've looked at the marriage in Christ, we've looked at the the um, position in Christ that we're to pursue Christ and see the righteousness of sin and pursue Him and trust in Him for for salvation and sanctification for the growing in the walk with the Lord, and then thirdly, your victory in Christ. Your victory in Christ. Why is it, excuse me, why is it that Paul writes this chapter? It's getting late. Why is it that Paul writes this chapter? Romans 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who raised from the dead, that we should what? Bring forth fruit unto God. 
That is why he died to bring us fruit. That we might bear fruit in our lives. Just notice the comparison between Romans 6 and Romans 7. Romans 6 verse 1, Paul mentions sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 7, law, he mentions the law. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law have dominion over the man as long as he liveth. So, sin, the law. Now, notice the comparison again. Romans 6, 2. Death died. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? We're dead to sin. Romans 7, 4. We're dead to the law. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We're dead to sin, we're dead to the law. Now, Romans 6 verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. So we're free from sin. Now we're free from the law. Romans 7 6. But now we are delivered from the law, the being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of life and not in the oldness of the letter. So he mentions sin, law. He mentions death to sin, death to law. He mentions uh, life in, in Christ. He mentions life in Christ. Comparison of Romans 6 and 7. But it's all to the end of life. wants us to bear fruit. I had an uncle, Uncle Jack, and he had a garden, and at the end of the garden was a greenhouse, and there there were these big ripe tomatoes, and I always used to scratch my head as a little boy and wonder how on earth he got those tomatoes, but that's what God wants you to do, is to bear fruit, to be, to be bearing fruit fruit in your life to be luscious in the spiritual realm galatians chapter 5 galatians chapter 5 verse 22 galatians 5 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the flesh, in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Look. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. Are we bearing fruit? It's not good standing still. It's not good saying I'll live the way I want. I'll sleep around. I'll, I'll get drunk and I'll, I'll do it every week and it's all right. Or, uh, or backsliding all the time. No, we've got to go forward. We've got to bear fruit. Why would the Son of God die for you just to leave you to stand where you are? He died for you that you may bear fruit. He wants you to bear fruit. And not only does he want you to, you can do because you have all the power that you need in Christ. All the power that you need. All the power that you need. All the power that you need is in Christ. It's in Christ. My friend, it's in Christ. All the power that you need is in Christ. All the joy, all the blessings, all the strength, all that you need is in Him. The beautiful Saviour. So we come to the conclusion. Final conclusion. Number one, don't judge yourself. Don't condemn yourself. Yes, you've failed in the past. Yes, you've made mistakes. But if you keep condemning yourself now, you're going back to the law. You're trying to establish yourself by the law. That's why you're condemned. You need to focus on Christ and realize that you're forgiven. Yes, you've made past mistakes, but they are washed and forgiven under the blood of the Lord. And you are to live in the joy and the presence of the holy, holy wonderful God who's provided you all that you need in Christ, all the salvation and the provision in the beautiful Savior. Then 
There is a person who says, well, you know, it's great. I'm saved in Christ. I, I'm, I'm born again. I, 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 I'm in Christ and I don't have to obey the law. I can live the way I want. No, 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 you cannot. No, when you come to know Christ, you know the sinfulness of sin and you will not want to sin. You will want to please Christ. And you will uphold the law. You will obey the law. But in the spirit, in the, in, in, in the, in the union with Christ and in the spirit, but you will obey the law. And then some will, some will say, well, if we're in Christ, we abandon the law. We forget the law. No, the Bible never says that. If you turn to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. And this is important because you've got to get the balance of truth. I've heard a great preacher today, a mighty preacher, a man of God I love and esteem very, very highly, very, very highly. And he teaches that we forget the law, that we're sanctified in Christ and we forget the law. And I admire this man and I love this man and he's a great leader amongst God's people. But he has not got the balance of, of scripture. You've got to be careful that you get the right balance by checking scripture with scripture. Looking at your biblical teaching, your biblical doctrine, your th systematic theology. And comparing with scripture with scripture within the Bible uh, uh, and, and, and checking things out. And so you find that we don't abandon the law. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not... Sorry. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. We're not to sin. Verse 4. But he said, I know him and keepeth not. He that said, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected hereby know we that we are in him. We obey the commandments. That's when we know that we're in God. But we do it in Christ. Uh, Romans chapter Romans chapter 7 verse 25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the Lord of God, but with the flesh the Lord of sin. But he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 8 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, we're in Christ. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. He shall save us from the sin by dying for us, and when we are united with him, deliver us from the power of sin. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 9 and 11. Wherefore God had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're to, we're to confess Christ, we're to look to Christ and trust in Christ, and to, to understand all that God has provided for us in Christ, all that Christ is. He is our salvation and He is our sanctification. And we, we have to focus on Christ. The moment we focus on the law and try to obey the law in our own strength, we become condemned. The moment we say that we can live the way we want, we've moved away from true Christianity because the law is to be upheld. But it's in relation to our position that our position is that we're redeemed that we're united to Christ and all the joy and the blessings and 
the fruit of who he is is put to our account and the power and the joy of God flows through us and we delight in the Lord of God and we desire to obey the Lord of God and we can obey it in the spirit as we meditate on the glory of Christ and on the, the need to love our fellow man. Oh my friends, let's just turn for the minute in John 15. John 15, such glorious teaching, all the glorious teaching of the word. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide of the vine. No more can you accept to abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Oh, the, the Saviour is masterful in his illustration here. Masterful in his teaching. And he's saying that as you trust in him, he's the vine. And as the branches in the vine, the pulse of the life of the vine goes into the branch of the branch burst fruit. And as you and I have faith in Christ, his life giving power pulses in our lives, beats in our lives, and begins to bear fruit in our life. But it's been in the vine. And that is the relationship to the law. We do not abandon the law. We uphold the law. But it's in relation to the vine that we are in Christ. May God bless you. I hope that's been a blessing. I pray and ask God to bless. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and grace and we give you the praise and the glory. We pray, Lord, that your people will be blessed by this video. In the name of Jesus and for your glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening and take care. God bless.